Spain, 1936. The theater for a civil war which would symbolize the conflict between the two great ideologies of the 20th century, communism and fascism. For centuries, Spain had suffered under the repressive alliance of landlord, church, and army. The Spanish Civil War would tear the country apart as nationalists and republican forces fought for control. The fascist armies of Italy and Germany joined the nationalists in their crusade against communism. Hitler's newly formed Luftwaffe began the first bombing campaign against a defenseless civilian population. From 54 countries, 35,000 volunteers joined the International Brigade to fight the Republican cause. The Soviet Union voted to support their newfound comrades in arms. Without the sanction of their government, Many volunteers followed secret routes across the Pyrenees to train alongside the Republican army. It was a conflict which caught the imagination of the world. The Spanish people were caught in the middle of a bloody and vicious struggle between the old order and the new. By 1939, the Republican army was destroyed. Under the leadership of General Francisco Franco, the nationalists took control of Madrid. Franco would rule Spain for the next 36 years. The utopian dreams of the world's socialists lay in ruins. Over half a million people had died on an ideological battlefield. The communist dream was born in Russia. The Industrial Revolution heralded a new political revolution. It would change the lives of millions. By 1914, Russia had become the world's fifth largest industrial force. But despite the rise of the new industrialists, the old aristocratic order prevailed. The traditional hierarchy of Tsar, landed nobility and church refused to surrender its position of privilege.
While the wealthy enjoyed the luxuries of leisure, the rural peasant suffered in poverty. After decades of laboring in the fields of rich landlords, a wave of peasants moved into the cities in search of employment in the new factories. But life in the overcrowded cities was just as hard. The outbreak of the First World War made life even harder. Russia sent nine million troops to the front lines. But the soldiers were ill-equipped and underfed. They suffered a series of devastating defeats. By 1915, a million men had died and a further one million captured. Against widespread criticism, Tsar Nicholas took over as commander-in-chief of the Russian armies. But while he attempted to bolster the morale of his men, his government in Petrograd faltered under the pressure of economic crisis. A further three million men were sent into battle. Badly trained, often armed only with bayonets, they were hurled at the German machine guns. The Tsar's military leadership was disastrous. Within a year, another million men had died. With so many fighting on the front, farming and industry were crippled. By 1917, bread and fuel had become increasingly scarce. Tens of thousands were out of work or on strike. A provisional government took control. In March, Tsar Nicholas abdicated. His departure paved the way for the return of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, Lenin. After years in exile, Lenin was free at last to propagate the revolutionary cry of Karl Marx. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communist revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. Bolshevik agitators took the revolution to the Eastern Front. War only benefits the ruling classes, they claimed. Thousands of peasant soldiers deserted. Lenin promised a revolutionary utopia. In the autumn of 1917, the Bolshevik Red Army stormed the Winter Palace. It was a turning point in 20th century history recreated by Sergei Eisenstein in his classic film, October. By the end of 1917, almost all of Russia was under the new Soviet control. Lenin promised peace, land, and bread. Peace for the soldiers, land for the peasants and bread for the workers. But the revolution did not pass unopposed. In 1918, Russia descended into civil war. After three years, the Bolshevik Reds defeated the White Army. Two years before his death in 1924, 
Lenin established the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The world's first egalitarian society had been born. The greatest revolutionary of the 20th century had created his communist utopia. In America, free enterprise ruled. The United States was the towering example of opportunism in the Western world. The business of America is business, declared its president, Calvin Coolidge, in 1925. New York's Statue of Liberty was the symbol of a new life. Its inscription read, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Millions of immigrants from around the world answered her call. By the start of the First World War, more than 10 million people had come to seek their fortune amidst the bright lights of America. The famous Roaring Twenties was an era of unprecedented ambition, confidence and optimism. But on the 24th of October, 1929, the capitalist dream turned sour. The party was over. On Black Tuesday, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed. Billions of dollars were lost overnight. The dreams of thousands of investors, big and small, had been shattered. The Wall Street crash plunged America into depression. One in four Americans found themselves out of work. The limited welfare system was unable to cope. Millions were forced to rely on charity. Soup kitchens were set up on street corners across America. The scale of unemployment devastated the country as frustration turned to violence. It seemed that capitalism had failed the world's greatest democracy. The shock waves of the Wall Street crash were felt across the world. Germany had enjoyed a boom built on the back of US loans. But when the Americans called in the debt, the German economy collapsed. At the height of the depression, almost half the workforce were without jobs. But in 1933, one man broke through the atmosphere of doom to offer the promise of hope. Adolf Hitler's National Socialists swept to power. The Nazis vowed to restore Germany's pride and prosperity. With all opposition parties crushed, the Nazis' first priority was to restore the nation's confidence and sense of worth. Hitler sent the German people back to work. Unemployment was cut by over 50% in under a year. By 1939, most of Germany was working again. But it was all part of Hitler's greater plan for the Third Reich. The famous autobahns would one day speed the flow of his armed forces across Germany. For the German people, life was good again. Their sense of shame following defeat in World War I had been replaced by a new sense of unity and optimism.
the Nazi party began to infiltrate all aspects of day-to-day -day life. The German people found themselves increasingly marching to the tune of fascism. Under the careful orchestration of his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler became the focus of fanatical adoration. In the eyes of the German people, he had become a messiah-like figure, the leader who was sent to save them and make Germany great once more. As the German people fell under Hitler's spell, the nation's Jews, communists, socialists, all enemies of the Third Reich were excised from German life. Hitler's utopian vision was of a thousand-year Reich, a master race, an idealized folk community of the strong, the pure, and the beautiful. As early as 1924, Hitler had recognized the importance of capturing the hearts and minds of Germany's young. The Hitler Youth Movement was the perfect tool for mass indoctrination. By 1936, membership was compulsory. At vast rallies, thousands gathered to pledge their fervent and devoted allegiance to the Führer. Hitler had written that the young would be systematically tempered and hardened for the demands to be made on them in later years. Boys were issued with uniforms, their youthful aggression harnessed. Hitler's youth would become Germany's army. At his country retreat in the hills above Berchtesgarten, Hitler and his favored ministers discussed the fate of Germany and the world. As the empire expanded, Hitler turned his sights to the rest of Europe. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. <laughs> Deutschland 
Communist Russia and the capitalist West joined forces to defeat Hitler's expansionist aspirations. The Second World War raged for six years. By 1944, the end was nigh for Germany. On April the 20th, 1945, the Russian army entered Berlin. Ten days later, Hitler committed suicide. The thousand-year Reich had lasted 12 years and three months. Hitler's dream of a master race had come to a catastrophic end. Amongst the ruins of the Reich, the German people scrabbled for survival. 20 million were homeless. Give me five years and you will not recognize Germany again, Hitler had promised his people before the war. But he betrayed their trust. Their hopes were destroyed by his own ambition. Hitler had offered Germany a utopia built on megalomania and racial hatred. His vision had created a hell on earth. In China, it was a communist revolutionary who promised his people a new, egalitarian utopia. From his stronghold in Yan'an, Mao Zedong evolved his master plan for the world's greatest communist utopia. While he took example from the teachings of Marx and Lenin, Mao's revolutionary dream was aimed at the peasants. They would be the reapers of his continual revolution. For more than 2,000 years, China had been ruled by imperialist emperors. At the beginning of the 20th century, 90% of the population was still confined to the poverty of the countryside. Following the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty in 1911, China descended into political turmoil and continuing hardship. Before Mao's dream of a communist utopia could be realized, he had to defeat the forces of a powerful rival party, Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang. A long civil war ensued. Mao achieved victory in 1948. Chiang Kai-shek and thousands of refugees fled to Taiwan. On the 1st of October, 1949, Mao Zedong became the first leader of the People's Republic of China. His 27-year democratic dictatorship had begun. Mao's priority was to haul China into the 20th century. Frustrated by the slow pace of change, in 1958 he embarked on the Great Leap Forward. It became the age of the backyard blast furnace. 
600,000 miniature furnaces were set up across China in an attempt to double its steel production. Villagers gave up their tools and cooking pots to be melted down. The spirit of communist ideology thrived. Mao glorified the peasants of the new people's communes. In return, they followed his every whim. Nothing was to stand in the way of the great leap forward, not even the birds of the air. Every time a bird took a grain of rice, it deprived the people of food, or so the theory went. Mao mobilized the whole of China to kill the sparrows. Great Leap Forward was turning into a grotesque failure. Fewer sparrows meant more insects. The overproduction of steel took millions of workers from the fields. Crops failed. Famine ensued. 20 million people died for the sake of Mao's grand experiment. But Mao was the great survivor. Communist ideology became Mao Tse Tung thought. The whole country was steeped in the teaching of the Little Red Book. In 1966, the Cultural Revolution saw the climax of Mao's personality cult. Endless atrocities were committed in the name of ideological purity. Anarchy ensued as the factions Mao had unleashed struggled for his inheritance. By 1978, they had corrupted his already distorted utopian dream. In the ancient kingdom of Cambodia, a man planned to replicate Mao's 27 years of continual revolution overnight, and he plunged his country into a 20th century dark age. In April 1975, the communist Khmer Rouge army entered the capital Phnom Penh. At gunpoint, they marched the three million inhabitants out of the city. Pol Pot, leader of the Khmer Rouge, demanded total social revolution. Cambodian history was to begin again at the year zero. The entire Cambodian population was forced into the countryside. In Pol Pot's warped vision of rural utopia, money was banned, religion outlawed, life easily expendable. Buddhist monks were declared parasites. Of the two and a half thousand monks at the start of Pol Pot's murderous regime, only 70 survived. The renamed Democratic Republic of Kampuchea became a nation of workers and peasants. They toiled in the fields for 16 hours a day. Those who fell by the wayside were simply executed. Hundreds of thousands died from exhaustion, hunger, and disease. Only when the Vietnamese entered Cambodia in 1979 was the full horror of the killing fields revealed. Thousands had been systematically murdered by the Khmer Rouge. Their crimes, they spoke French, they had an education, they wore glasses. More than a million and a half Cambodians lost their lives in Pol Pot's quest for utopia. 
20% of the population had died. The 20th century has been witness to some of the worst acts of genocide in history, all in the name of ideological utopia. Throughout their long history of persecution, the Jewish people always held on to their utopian dream. A return to Zion and the creation of an independent state of Israel. Thousands of immigrants poured into Palestine to lay the foundations of their ancestral homeland. At the start of the Second World War, over a quarter of a million Jews had arrived in the Promised Land. The horrors of the Nazi Holocaust brought thousands more. International support for Jewish statehood grew. In America, President Truman increased his political involvement in response to growing public pressure. Truman backed the partition of Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states. In 1947, the United Nations adopted the partition plan. On the 14th of May, 1948, David Ben-Gurion became the first president of the State of Israel. But the realization of a Jewish utopia brought suffering to the Palestinians. On the day of independence, just one minute after midnight, the first Arab-Israeli war began. 90,000 Palestinian refugees were driven from their homes. In the decades that followed, the Arab-Israeli crisis brought chaos and violence to the whole of the Middle East. Despite the continuing unrest, Jerusalem remains the religious epicenter of the Jewish faith. In 1989, the disintegration of the Soviet bloc brought an unprecedented influx of Russian Jews to Israel. Over 600,000 became Jewish citizens. The same year, 15,000 Falashas, the black Jews of Ethiopia, were airlifted from the midst of civil war. Israeli leaders dubbed the rescue mission Operation Moses. But instead of the land of milk and honey, the Falashas found prejudice and opposition Orthodox Jews considered them inferior to the secular Jewish community. They were persecuted for not being Jewish enough. No longer refugees looking for a homeland, the Falashas are in search of recognition of their Jewishness. In 
Israel today seems less like the utopian dream it set out to be. It has become a country embroiled in conflict. The Jews may have secured their ancestral homeland, but in doing so, have evicted another people from theirs. The realization of utopia has come at a high price. Religion is the oldest utopia of all. Iran would bear witness to the greatest religious revolution of the 20th century. In the 1920s, the exploitation of the oil reserves beneath the desert sands of Persia transformed the country's economy and way of life. The revenue from the oil fueled the country's rapid industrialization. Persia was renamed Iran and remodeled along Western lines. In 1941, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi became Shah of Iran. In what became known as the White Revolution, he turned Iran into one of the most westernized nations in the Muslim world. Western methods of education were adopted. Women were given greater freedom and the right to vote. Boys and girls sat alongside each other in school. The Shah welcomed businessmen from the West and encouraged foreign investment and imports into the country. But Iran's wealth remained unfairly distributed. As the rich became richer, a growing number of religious leaders spoke out against what they saw as corrupt, immoral Western influences. The leader of the movement against the Shah was the exiled Ayatollah Khomeini. On the 8th of September 1978, three quarters of a million of his supporters marched towards the center of Tehran. As they approached Jala Square, the Shah's troops opened fire. A hundred people died on a day that was to become known as Black Friday. But the Shah's brutal suppression of the demonstrators did little to dampen their calls for religious revolution. Martial law was imposed, but still the protests continued. By December, the number of protesters calling for the death of the Shah and the return of Ayatollah Khomeini had swollen to five million. This time, the troops didn't open fire. The Shah's reign was over. In January 1979, he left Iran never to return. A month later, Ayatollah Khomeini returned from exile. For the millions of Iranians who welcomed him home, life was about to change dramatically. The Ayatollah imposed Islamic law. Women were obliged to adopt the veil. Bars and cinemas were closed down alcohol and Western music banned. The Ayatollah's return to Iran signaled the start of a worldwide Islamic revolution.
In Iran, America and the capitalist West became the new enemy of the Ayatollah's Islamic utopia. But for millions of people around the world, America is still the land of opportunity. The American dream, a never-ending road to success and personal utopia. For well over half a century, Walt Disney has recreated a lost world of fantasy and adventure. In Disneyland, any dream can come true. But now, Disney have taken a slice of the American dream and turned it into reality. A few miles south of the Magic Kingdom, the cardboard facades of Disneyland's Main Street are made of real bricks and mortar. The town of Celebration is a housing project for 20,000 people who have opted for the nostalgia and tradition of small town life. America, the land of the free, has become a land of choice where personal utopias can be fulfilled, even in the swamplands of Florida. God bless America. Just 90 miles off America's Florida coast lies a very different kind of utopia. For almost 30 years, the island of Cuba has been under the control of communist revolutionary Fidel Castro. From the hills surrounding Havana, Castro led one of the century's great romantic revolutions. In 1959, he liberated Cuba from the American-backed military dictatorship of General Batista. When Castro turned to the Soviet Union for military and financial support, Cuba became the communist enemy in America's backyard. Fifty years on, Cuba remains one of the last surviving strongholds of communism. But the disintegration of the communist bloc has had a profound impact on Castro's communist utopia. The billion-dollar subsidies from Moscow have come to an end. Today, Cuba is becoming as famous for sun, sea and sand as for revolution. It is the more traditional attractions of a Caribbean isle that are pulling in the dollar-spending tourists who now help prop up the Cuban economy. But for ordinary Cubans, life is becoming increasingly hard. The revolutionary message hasn't changed, but the reality is a shattered economy and an isolated regime. Since the revolution, over a tenth of the population has fled. In homemade boats, Cubans cross the treacherous 90 miles of sea that separates communism from the bright lights of capitalism. As we approach the end of this century, communism is having to adopt a more pragmatic stance to ensure its survival in the next. In Vietnam, once the setting for a devastating ideological war, the door has been opened on Western-style consumerism. Vietnam has undergone a decade of economic reforms. In 1993, 
America finally lifted her trade embargo. Today, the trappings of capitalism are readily available as Vietnam sets out to emulate the other financial tigers of Southeast Asia. The countries of the Pacific Rim have emerged as the financial superpowers of the future. Along with Japan, China has led the new economic revolution. China is now challenging the economic imperialism of the West. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping launched China on a path of economic liberalization. Communism embraced pragmatism. Mao Zedong thought was replaced by Deng Xiaoping's new brand of slogan, to be rich is glorious. Where Mao's great leap forward had failed, Deng's four modernizations thrived. In 1979, peasant communes were reformed. Farmers were given individual plots of land. Agricultural output rose nearly 50% in five years. Individual enterprise was encouraged. People swarmed to China's special economic zones. China has started to open her doors to capitalism. The dreams of ordinary people are no longer constrained by the dogma of ideological utopia. Millions of workers produce consumer goods for export to the rest of the world. The factories still adhere to the strict discipline of the old-style communes, but the wages are considerably higher than in the rest of China. People not only work for the greater good of the state, but also for themselves. China didn't have to look too far for a shining example of capitalism. Her shores are lit by the bright lights of Hong Kong. Hong Kong ranks among the 10 richest states in the world. This small, overcrowded island represents a triumph of capitalism and opportunism. On the 30th of June, 1997, Hong Kong was reunified with China. As the People's Liberation Army crossed the border, 155 years of British colonial rule came to an end. For the next 50 years, China has promised Hong Kong will continue trading as a free market. Communism and capitalism will have to learn to coexist. As the 20th century draws to an end, will the world's last great bastion of Lenin's communist revolution see its utopian ideals tempted by the seductions of capitalism? In Russia, the birthplace of Lenin's revolution, religion was once banned as the opium of the people. Now, the oldest utopia of them all is being resurrected.
This has been a century of revolution and utopian dreams. New ideologies have changed the course of history like never before. They have offered hope. Many have failed. Others have ended in tragedy. But inevitably, our quest for utopia will continue. It will continue for as long as we have belief and faith in a better world.